Hello and welcome everyone. Good morning. I'm Suranjana from the Viro Commission and I'm in Bangalore. The Viro Commission and Slum Dwellers International are together hosting this event on impacting policies. We are here to talk about how grassroots movements are actually influencing and bringing about change in public planning policies, programs, and public decision making. Too often, I think the, the response we hear from people when they hear about grassroots initiatives is that they're just too small to be recalled, too local, we're too anecdotal. But despite all these disadvantages, we can see that grassroots organizations and their movements are making solid impacts based on the work they're doing on the ground. So today we have uh, representatives from three global grassroots movements. We have uh, WIGO, we have uh, Slum Dwellers International, and we have the Viro Commission represented by activists from these organizations. And then we have also the policy side of the discussion from, uh, we have a special guest, Orgo Sinharoy from, the, uh, from ADB. And uh, to take you through this morning's event, we have a very special facilitator, and it's my great privilege to have the opportunity to um, introduce her. It's uh, Corazon Solomon, also called Dinky. Dinky has not only a lifetime of activism uh, behind her, she's been someone who's trained hundreds of grassroots activists and community leaders in the Philippines, but she's also had two terms as the Secretary, Department of Social Welfare and Development in the Government of Philippines. Um, and during her term did a substantial amount of work to build bridges between government and grassroots. So she's a very unique and special facilitator and we're very privileged to have her facilitating the discussion today. At present, she's the lead on social protection and community-driven development at the International Center for Excellence and Governance. So with that, let me hand you over to Dinky, and I'll be back at the end to wrap up. So welcome, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Saranjana, and uh, thank you to that very nice introduction. Welcome to everyone who has joined this uh, session uh, and uh, we're going to have a very exciting session so but before we start uh, let us work uh, go through some of the protocols of how we are going to use the zoom so they will be flashing that so in the screen uh, and, uh, first of all this meeting is being recorded and parts of it will be available on Huayro Commission Islam Dwellers International and IIED's website at a later date. If there are concerns that you may have uh, in this being recorded, please uh, put that in the chat box and get in touch privately with Lynn Morna. Lynn Morna and put it in the chat box. Now, please do not share the link to join this meeting on social media. We have taken security precautions against Zoom bombing. And if you notice any such content, please notify Lynn Morna via the chat function. Please also close all non-essential applications in your device, such as Skype, so that we can have a better connection. And please mute your microphone if you're not speaking. You can switch off your video if you are experiencing connection problems. And also please use the chat box for comments and questions. We want to encourage uh, more interaction. And if you face any technical issues, uh, please notify Lynn Morna via the chat function. We will be having a closed caption uh, when closed captioning when our colleague from Indonesia will be speaking. Uh, so that means that you have to go to the bottom of your uh, page of Zoom and where it indicates more, there will be a, a, a thing called CC. So click on that so that uh, the subtitles will show in your screen. Uh, Ibu Ronyatun will be speaking in Bahasa Indonesia, and that is where you will see uh, the translation. Now, before we begin, we would really like to know who we are and what we're about. Uh, so we will be using the Mentimeter uh, as a gauge, and uh, the Mentimeter link 
is uh, in the chat box already, uh, so I don't see it yet. Uh, please uh, put in the Mentimeter link that people can go into uh, for our our uh, volunteer tech, uh, so that everyone can do their link on the Mentimeter. Uh, the Mentimeter will be giving us a sense of what are the countries that are uh, represented here. And at the same time, we would want to know what type of organizations you belong to. So, uh, Tech, can I get, uh, from the volunteers, can I get the link uh, in the chat box so people can go into the Mentimeter? So, after selecting municipality, the municipality, there it is. Right. Have and you normally seen when it? we have uh, uh, the project, Okay, so there, everyone, there is the Mentimeter link, and you have to use if you don't have the, uh, if you don't have the, uh, you have to use the code eight nine three nine three six zero. Again, you have to use the code of eight nine three nine three six zero. So, uh, please go into this and. Uh, which country are you joining from? So please type in the country that you are joining from so that you will, we will see how many are being represented here and where we're all coming from. So then after that, We will be seeing uh, the results of this uh, in a bit. Uh, we will be seeing this. So there you are. Uh, we are in different parts, Myanmar, Netherlands, Kenya, India, Tanzania, Denmark, Germany, South Africa, Scotland, France, United States, Indonesia, Uganda. So that's uh, quite a bit of a big uh, Singapore. Uh, did I miss out on anything? Uh, Indonesia, of course, UK, uh, Denmark, and Germany. So we are quite a big international group that uh, are here. So shall we go to the next question uh, for uh, in a Mentimeter? So shall we go to the next question now, tech support? Uh, moving on. Uh, So we, what kind of organization do you represent? A national NGO, international NGO, a grassroots based organization, research, policy making, um, local government, private sector and others. So again, we will be looking at uh, the results in a few minutes. There you have it. Many of us are in the inter, from the international NGOs. Uh, then second to it is grassroots and community-based organization. And then the national or NGOs are coming in next. And we have one from a policy research organization and three from others. But a majority of us are coming from international NGOs and uh, grassroots organization. And the last question, uh, there are some, somebody just texted that someone's from the national government. So we do have some other participants uh, who are not NGOs and some are from policy making. So moving on, let's uh, go back now to the last question of the Mentimeter. Uh, shall we flash that, the Mentimeter question, the last, uh, which is a question of what kind of movements uh, do you belong to? Shall we flash the Mentimeter question on this? Uh, okay, going in again. So there you go. Uh, human rights, environment, grassroots, indigenous, urban poor, women's empowerment. Uh, what, where do you belong? And then submit and we'll see how many of us are coming from different movements in our country. So many of us are coming from, are, are very involved in women 
in environment and then the next one is the women empowerment grassroots is uh, coming in strong human rights and democracy uh indigenous people uh five percent of urban poor and others but a majority of us are part of environment movements here so we come from a broad group of uh representation from different parts of the world uh, many of us are NGOs, CSOs, and in movements for social change, many of us are working in the environment uh, sector uh, and in the grassroots sector. So we are now going to have a good conversation between and among us. We have a good spread of participants, and we really do encourage you to please uh, interact through the chat box and uh, give your opinions as we hear. Uh, the panel discuss, discuss us. Uh, today we're really going to talk about how does, as Surangela said in the beginning, the initiatives of people who are working on the ground, grassroots organizations, especially women-led organizations on the communities, are doing their uh, responses to very basic needs that they have to address because it's their families and it's their communities that are affected. And in, do, in so doing, they know the limitation of doing it just within the community or within the towns that they work in, that they have used uh, their organization and their capacity to influence policies. And the policies that they need to influence are from subnational to national and into global uh, policies that impact into their communities. So we will be hearing how they were able to influence uh, these institutions at different levels and how that made an impact on the work that they are doing at the grassroots level. And uh, I think it's very important for us to do this because we all know how interconnected uh, we all are and how policies decided at the national level, at the big cities, impact on rural communities and rural uh, villages in urban poor communities. And uh, we have a very exciting uh, panel because these are all people who have been working closely and extensively and deeply into these issues. So I'd like to start introducing uh, our panel now. And uh, we are very fortunate to have everyone uh, uh, being able to connect uh, given the challenges of um, connectivity. We have uh, Violet Shibutse. She is a grassroots women leader and founder of Shibuya Community Health Workers. Her background is caregiving, which through that role, she initiated the women land rights in Shibuya Community Health Workers and work on community resilience. Uh, she has led community driven processes that position grassroots women as key actors in influencing policies on land agriculture and basic service delivery. So that's uh, uh, Violet. Next we have Ibu Ronyatun, is a grassroots leader from Indonesia, affiliated with Yakum in Emergency Unit, a member of the Huayro Commission. She's actively involved in community financing and DRR activities, identifying disaster prone areas within the village, establishing evaluate, evacuation routes, and updating community databases, especially to include vulnerable groups. As a grassroots leader, Ibu Runyatu advocates for allocation of village development budget to address the needs of women and children. She will also be assist assisted by Agnes uh, Maria or Mia, who will be supporting uh, Ibu Runyatu as a co-panelist. The next panelist is Nancy Noki is a social activist and grassroots leader of uh, Mongaro Wa Wanaji, a national federation of slum dwellers in Kenya. Nancy has supported communities to partner with government or slum upgrading projects, including the president uh, setting Mukuru SPA project in Nairobi, building strong relationships between uh, the stakeholders and assisting communities to build consensus on strategy, budgeting, planning, and project implementation. And the next speaker is Kabiru 
Arora. Kabir Arora is the national coordinator of the Alliance of Indian Way Speakers, a national network of way speakers organizations in India. He is also involved with the mapping of way speakers organizations in Asia for women in informal employment for globalizing and organizing, WIGO, and the Global Alliance of Way Speakers. Uh, the next one is uh, someone who has worked very closely uh, um, with us. He is uh, the Senior Climate Change Specialist for Climate Change Adaptation of Asian Development Bank. He supports climate change adaptation related policies and investments of ADB and is involved in developing a new program on community resilience. So you see how rich and how interesting our panels are, are and let's begin and start the sharing. Uh, I'd like to now uh, start with um, Violet and uh, I think it's important to hear from Violet her experience in um, what has been the uh, experience about grassroots based movements uh, and their ability to influence policy. How did you change the perception of government or other stakeholders towards grassroots leadership in community resilience? Over to you, Violet. Thank you so much, Diggy, and thank you, everyone. It is my pleasure to be speaking in this important session. As Diggy says, I come from an organization that is in based in the rural part of Kenya, which is called Shibuya Community Health Workers. And Shibuya Community Health Workers is a member of a global movement of grassroots women called Wairu Commission. I want to share our experience, how we began working as a collective in influencing policy and what prompted us to begin uh, working in influencing policy or uh, working to ensure government put policies in place that fit into the priorities that we care about. As grassroots women from rural communities, our main source of livelihood is farming. And farming was really impacted with climate change. And one of the negative implications was that our soil has completely been washed away. Land has been degraded, especially uh, those of us who live along uh, areas that are valleys or sloppy. Land has been degraded a lot. And as women, the production of food, the soil pH has uh, really been compromised. And production of food uh, hasn't been going on well. Because of this, uh, we began an initiative on soil rehabilitation and management. And we worked with a local uh, college to train grassroots women to understand processes like mulching, to understand how to plant uh, crop slope uh, barrier crops that ensure water does not flow, uh, the soil does not, is not washed away by erosion. We also have been having long spells of uh, sun, and during this time, equally, the land gets degraded when it's windy. So we were looking at the best way that we could advance our farming practices and manage our soil and be able to really practice sustainable agriculture, which includes agroforestry and many other things. When we began this initiative, we were really impacted because Grassroots, as grassroots women, as grassroots women, uh, we do not own land or we don't have rights to access land. Land inheritance takes forever uh, uh, to inherit and the processes are so long. At times also, the land that the families have is still very, is very small. Even as you struggle for inheritance, it is not land that can be able to feed you and uh, sustain the family livelihood as a farmer. So the option we had was land leasing. And land leasing has never been streamlined by the government of Kenya. The land leasing that appears in the constitutions is the big land leasing 
that uh, uh, big business people are involved in that lease land for like 100 years, like multinationals. But the small lease that we do day to day to grow vegetable that we can sell for livelihood, to grow food, hasn't really been factored. So as grassroots women organization, we were able to start this discussion. We conducted a consultation meetings. First of all, we did a research with a team from a German that is called TMG, which comes from Berlin, to reveal issues around land and especially show how land leasing would create an alternative for women and youth who cannot access land to access land for agriculture and the conflicts around land could be addressed. So this was a big uh, program because land governance is a big issue and it's very sensitive when you begin talking about it. So we began with doing very uh, co uh, strong community consultation meetings at village level to hear the perspective of community and the experience of people that have leased land, which in many times, those who leased land, especially women who had bigger land and gave out their land to lease like pay school fees for their children, this land ended up being taken and scrapped from them. And those women who went to lease land as leasers so that they would plant things, uh, sometimes when they start improving this land, they would be thrown out of the land. So equally, the leasee and the leaser were all very vulnerable in this condition. So we got a lot of support uh, from this, and we will have been able to drive this process further until we have a very good guideline that we call Community Driven Land Lease Guideline, which is being implemented in nine wards in Kakamega. We have expanded with this land lease guideline to Homer Bay, and we have actually really seen how women are involved in land leasing and how many women are uh, doing uh, soil rehabilitation and are going through trainings and youth and how production and food security has increased at, uh, in homes. But because of this, we said this is not enough. We must ensure we push this to become a legal framework. So uh, during this time that uh, as from March, we started convening online meetings with our county government in Kakamega and Homer Bay to discuss how to make the community-driven land lease guideline to become a legal framework. We have received a lot of acceptance. And I want to tell this conference that this is the first time in our history that the community is coming up with their own policy that they are pushing the government to be able to put uh, as a, a legal framework that is going to work for the community. We are doing com uh, public hearing which we are leading, we have shared roles. The legislatures from the uh, county assembly are involved in the process. We are all speaking about these land lease guidelines. We produced a documentary and the governor himself is speaking strongly to say this document, when it becomes a legal framework, it is going to save the situation and improve agricultural productivity. So that's how far we are. But because of also this bargaining and collective uh, working as grassroots women. We have also participated strongly in uh, putting our priorities in soil conservation and uh, policy that was developed in Kakamega, which was being led by GIZ. We participated and this actually really uh, made us to ensure the priorities in soil rehabilitation also focus on things grassroots women care about. We have also participated in influencing other policies, policies on inheritance, showing gaps in policies. And now I would actually say the grassroots women are really agents in policy and very much involved in policy than any other time. We have Zoom calls every time speaking about this policy. We didn't even go to sleep during the COVID time. We were all active and we would call for a meeting and we have 30 grassroots women turning up to speak to the government. We also now are pushing for another thing which is called a governor's day with farmers. The grassroots women have initiated this process which on this day that will be placed on every calendar year, the grassroots women will be small scale farmers, will be accessing the governor himself and all policy makers 
Everything will stop in the county. That is just a day for the county government to listen to the grassroots women, which is very, very good. And we have organized how we want it to look like, how we want participation from the bottom, how we will organize ourselves to ensure the themes that we are going to speak on the governor's day is a theme that comes from the bottom. The real small scale farmers on the ground. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Violet. I can see that you have really been able to move from uh, initiatives on the ground, impacting on uh, national policy and uh, also uh, district policies. Now we are going to listen uh, to Ibu Ronyatun and to Mia. Tell us about uh, the work that you do uh, about uh, with grassroots women leaders in your community that have done influence in uh, village plans and budgets to address the priorities on climate and disaster resilience. Ibu Runyatun. Hello, nama saya Runyatun dari Desa Ngalang, Kecamatan Gedang Sari, Kabupaten Gunung Hidul. Saya sebagai sekretaris kelompok perempuan Mantri Tangguh. Desa Ngalang memiliki beberapa resiko bencana, antara lain banjir, tanah longsor, angin puting beliung, dan kekeringan. Pada awalnya kami mencoba untuk mengatasi kerugian akibat bencana tersebut melalui kegiatan lumbung pangan, tetapi eh, keadaan terjadi gagal panen, maka kami mengembangkan kegiatan warung sembako, masyarakat sekitar dapat membeli sembako di kelompok kami dengan cara e, dicicil atau dibayar akhir bulan. Kemudian kami belajar dari kelompok perempuan lain e, pengelolaan bank sampah, kami mulai kegiatan bank sampah sakan manfaat manfaatnya. Dari kegiatan bank sampah, perempuan baik anggota kelompok kami maupun warga lain di desa kami memiliki pendapatan tambahan dan lingkungan juga menjadi lebih bersih, sehat, serta kegiatan pengelolaan sampah ini bisa mengurangi resiko banjir dan tanah longsor. Pada tahun 2017, Banjir dan tanah longsor yang menutupi akses jalan masuk ke desa ataupun masuk ke kecamatan. Warung kelompok kami mendukung penyediaan pangan lewat dapur umum selama akses desa tertutup atau beberapa hari untuk beberapa hari. Anggota kami juga ikut serta dalam kerja bakti pembersihan jalan yang tertutup longsor. Sejak itu, pemerintah desa mulai memberikan perhatian kepada kegiatan kelompok kami. Kami juga mendapat bagian dari forum pengurangan resiko bencana desa dan ikut berpendapat dalam rencana penanaman tanaman keras dan pohon buah-buahan di lokasi rawan bencana, tanah longsor. Pemerintah desa mengakui keberadaan kelompok kami dan hasil kegiatan kami terbukti bermanfaat bagi masyarakat umum, tidak hanya anggota saja, kami kemudian diminta untuk mewakili desa mengikuti lomba ataupun kegiatan yang lain di tingkat kecamatan dan mendapatkan presti, pres, pres, presentasi anggota kami juga melalui mendapat undangan untuk mengikuti musren bangdes atau musyawarah desa dan bisa memberikan usulan atau kegiatan untuk alokasi dana desa baik sebagai perwakilan kelompok perempuan, PKK, posyandu, ataupun PAUD, dan kegiatan lainnya. Kami membuat proposal kegiatan 
dalam uh, dan di PKK dan mengajukan dalam musyawarah bangdes musyawarah desa salah satu dukungan yang kami terima bagi kelompok perempuan adalah penambahan modal untuk warung sembako dan ruang kantor desa untuk uh, menjual uh, sembako ataupun warung sembakonya kami buka di uh, area lokasi desa. Disku, diskusi dalam penemuan tersebut tidak selalu lancar dan tidak semua usulan kami diterima. Namun kami meyakinkan pemerintah desa bahwa kegiatan kami bermanfaat tidak hanya bagi anggota tetapi juga seluruh warga desa. Sebelumnya meskipun kami diundang pertemuan desa, tetapi kami hanya sebagai pendengar penyaji eh, makanan kecil, snack atau makanan. Sekarang kami bisa ikut berpendapat dan menyuarakan kebutuhan kami. Pemerintah penerimaan pemerintah desa telah memberikan arti baru bagi keterlibatan kami dalam proses pengambilan keputusan ataupun pengelolaan dana desa dari keterlibatan kami di banyak kegiatan desa dan kecamatan kami sekarang memiliki kesempatan dan akses untuk menjalankan kerjasama dengan banyak pihak lain misalnya dengan LSM, universitas, lembaga keagamaan, dan sektor swasta. Besides managing the Community Resilience Fund to deal with the economic loss due to disaster and climate change, the women group were able to influence the decision-making process within their respective areas. Since 2015 and 2020, Yaku Member Sensi Unit has assisted about 59 women groups for community resilience fund initiatives. Each group received about uh, 400 to 470 US dollar, allowing them to initiate the resilience strategies at their respective sub-villages or villages. They started with conducted risk mapping and analysis the loss and strategies to deal with their condition due to disaster and climate change, which then link their strategies to local government's policy and programs. Although not all of the groups have progressed well and many are dealing with challenges, about 49 have sustainable activities developed from their community resilience fund initiatives and currently able to access supports and programs from governments in villages up to district levels to improve various district government offices, academics, faith-based organizations, NGOs, and private sectors. The supports that they have received varied from cash or capital fund for livelihood capacity building and in-kind, such as seats, assistive devices, place or rooms, and others. Departed from their beneficial initiatives, many grassroots women then being involved and invited to decision-making process such as this in the sub-village and village level for village development programs planning. The initiatives by grassroots women groups and their engagement with local government together influence or change the way the local government sees grassroots women and that their small community financing form of activities could benefit larger communities and contribute to village development. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Uyki Borunyatum. You could see the wide range of uh, work that you've been doing from disaster response, humanitarian, and uh, influencing the budget, and then networking with other groups, and then spreading this out to other communities to learn from your experience. Now we would like to call on uh, Nancy Nujoki. And uh, Nancy, can you tell us how were you able to mobilize or organize uh, the community and get the actions going? What kind of policy influence did you succeed to do and what was the impact of this policy change? Nancy? Thank you very much. 
I'm Nancy Njoki from Nairobi, Kenya. A member of the SGI Federation. So as communities in Kenya, we've been, we've been mobilizing communities for the last 20 years, but we have one example in, in Mokuru where we've been mobilizing the communities for the last 10 years. This is an area which suffers from very many threats especially the, the health care system is like broken down. We also have no sewer lines, no water. And one of the most, the biggest threat is the flooding. When it rains in Mokuru, you, it's practically impossible. You cannot go anywhere. The schools get submerged. You see the school gets submerged, the rivers sweep away houses. We have even cases of death. So as the Kenyan Federation, we've been doing mobilizing and organizing communities to form savings groups. When they form savings group, this becomes a tool for them to be advocating for their issues. So also in these savings, savings groups, we help the communities to sit down look in what issues are affecting them and come up with solution or even advocate to the duty bearers to help them deal with the solution. So in Mokuru, we collected community-led data. This data, we did it like in two or three, before we started the data two or three, we did it again, we updated the data also in two or five. Then we used this data to highlight the challenges and took this data to the Nairobi County government. So it was a process, a big process, convincing them, going to the meetings with them, going to the meetings at seven o'clock. By that time, they were saying, you have to go to the meetings early. If you are late, you, you miss that day again, you go for another day, you book a, an appointment, go for a meeting. So luckily in 2017, the county government was able to gazette the Mokuru area as a special planning area. So when they gazette an area as a special planning area, this gives the community the space, the space and the platform to come out with plans. These plans will influence the development of the area. So as a federation, we were given a key, a key component in the process. So we are the ones who are coordinating, coordinating other organizations, coordinating the county government, and also mobilize, continuing to mobilize the communities so as we can, we can be able to come up with a plan, an integrated development plan for the area. So as the Kenyan Alliance, we see this has been a big plus because like for now, the Kenyan, government, the Kenyan Alliance is seen as a key partner in the SPA development. We've been also been asked to help in the processes of helping the other area which has been declared as a special planning area, which is Kibira, to, to help them in organizing and also help them in, with coming up with, with how we will help how we will get the other organization which work in Kibera to help that area be able to make up their own integrated plan. So as for now, the Kenyan Alliance is seen as a key stakeholders. Every time we go to the meetings with the county government to talk about issues SPA, they will all, always refer to the Alliance and the strengths we've had in Mokuru and want to go ahead from that. They want to make it as a benchmarking. We've done this in Mokuru, so we want Mungano to help us do other special planning areas. So I see as communities, we have the power. We have the power to influence policy, and it's only to be given space and be given more capacities so that we can, we can, we can get that is inside us and help develop our areas. So 
also, I would also propose that in, even in this other local government, that the community voice is listened to, is listened to and is listened to and we are made the key stakeholders in any small development. Because like I see from Okuru now, even when the county wants to do additional data, they will use our communities to do the data. So this has been a big plus for the SDI Kenya Federation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. And uh, for uh, the next speaker, it will be Kabir. And uh, please tell us uh, your experience and how you were able to influence uh, policies in uh, addressing uh, solid waste management issues and uh, uh, how you were able to do this from the ground level. Kabir? Hi. Um, so I'll start. Um, yes, please. From Alliance of Indian Waste Pickers. Uh, it's a national network of waste pickers organizations across India. and. We're also part of the Global Alliance of Waste Pickers. I'm going to get into the question of how the, the policy work was amplified by the work on the ground. So there were a few things which um, I don't know how many people know about it. In 2016, the Union Government of India came up with, the, with solid waste management rules. And one of the greatest achievement or one of the greatest uh, uh, roadmap, which it, it, it was a roadmap for waste pickers integration. So it was a form of achievement for all of us. And, the, and it defined waste pickers rights. They have right to pick waste. They have right to identity as a worker. They, they have right to do organizing work. They have right to do skill upgradation, right to representation and entitlement of credit. And this sort of, uh, these rights were incorporated in SWM rules. And that happened because there was, um, uh, that happened because there were some of the things which, uh, uh, which were done on the ground. So let me get back to, in 1992 or 1993, uh, there was a first trade union of waste pickers, which was, which came in existence in Pune. And, uh, and they started organizing waste pickers in Pune specifically. Later that uh, waste pickers union became a trade, uh, union became a cooperative of waste pickers in 2008. And then similarly, something happened in Bangalore where waste pickers were organizing themselves in, since 2010. And we had dry waste collection centers uh, given to the waste pickers by the municipal authorities. And they've been engaged in, in managing that. In Mumbai, uh, waste pickers organized themselves and uh, started working in the composting services, uh, composting organic waste management services. And these three places had models of integration. And, and waste picking is, is an occupation where one can upgrade the occupation and get better uh, in terms of start working, start working in better uh, and hygienic and safe and healthy conditions. Plus, one can also complement the recycling systems which are ongoing in the cities. So we and there are around um, uh, three million waste pickers across India, and this is these are just different estimates provided by different organizations. Some say that there are two percent, two percent of the urban population is engaged in waste picking and informal recycling industry. So if you look at these numbers, there is a significantly large population which is working in waste picking and recycling. Now, what happened with these organizations, Pune, uh, one in Pune, one in Bangalore, and one in Mumbai, you had a complete shift in how uh, a mo model showcasing everyone that uh, waste pickers uh, can be integrated. They're a part of the system. They can better the waste management services. And to our good luck, uh, we also, the Union Minister of Environment and Forest and Climate Change at that time was Mr. Prakash Jabrekar. And he was also from Pune. So he was aware of what was going on in terms of waste pickers organizing. I'm sorry, just, um, yeah. So there was some uh, level of uh, waste pickers organizing work which was going on and Sorry. So waste pickers organizing work was going on. And then we had models of in integration to showcase. And then uh, the union ministry on its part invited waste pickers organization 
um, uh, waste pickers organizations across India to to be a part of the committee and suggest some changes in the rules. And then comes 2016 SWF rule. So you have three models which showcased how waste pickers can be integrated in the process. You had uh, significant changes in the in re informal recycling industry. You have uh, cities doing a little better, uh, being uh, are a little cleaner, and their cities also have a large citizens engagement in all these three cities. And it was reflected in the SWM rules 2016, which sort of you have we had created a cycle. Now, what happened with after 2016 rules came, all the municipal corporations were mandated to do the work which Pune, Bangalore, and uh, Mumbai have done. They have to show a similar waste pickers integration process. There was a whole mandate, there are rights of waste pickers, there, are, there is a whole program for the screen, uh, training and skill upgradation of waste pickers that was outlined. And there are some factors, there was another factor which played an important role was that the these three major organizations and some smaller organizations were working across India came together and set up a network which helped in uh, bringing learning exchange within the system as well as uh, as well as influencing the policy at national level collectively and not individual organizations taking the doing the advocacy work so these were some of the things which happened and it it helped us to amplify our work now uh, last year we got a chance from the national institute of urban affairs it's a um, union ministry of urban affairs think tank to showcase these models of integration to more than uh, 1500 uh, municipal officers across India and tell them that how this process has been done. So the and the waste pickers um, spoke the, directly to the municipal officials and said that this is what we have done in our cities. This is what we expect. And some of the waste pickers from those cities where these workshops were held also participated and and shared their own stories. So that was what um, what our work on policy and grassroots was. Thank you. Thank you, Kabir. Uh, you can see how uh, three initiatives in different parts of India had, are now slowly moving into influence uh, national policy. And, and I think very important, recognizing the rights of what usually is part of the informal sector, which are waste speakers being integrated into the formal sector. Now I think it's really interesting. We've had all our uh, panelists speak and uh, at this point, I would just want to call your attention that we have been able to really get a discussion going in the chat box. And there are many questions that have been directed uh, to our panelists. And we will get into that after I call on uh, our other guests who can bring us into a more regional perspective of how policy impacts, uh, how, it, how grassroots initiatives impacts the uh, policies at the regional multilateral uh, institutions. Uh, I think we've heard how important it is to be able to first really start from the perspective of the communities, perspective of the grassroots people, the families, the women who are actually feeling and are experiencing the issues. And from out of there, they will develop uh, solutions that will be responsive to the specific problem that they face. We've heard that in all four uh, experiences. And what is important, I think that they were able to move from organizing at the level of the village, at the level of the communities, at the urban poor communities, making it into a network, a network of community people acting together to ensure that what they saw as solutions at the level of the village or network of villages be institutionalized at the level of district and or province and or national government. And we've seen that uh, the group of Violet has been able to do this on uh, the land leasing uh, situation, uh, the situation of uh, Ibu Ronyatun influencing the budgets and then teaching what I think is important is influencing the budget at the level of the village, but then sharing that with so many other villages and so many other communities, which then had an impact for a government to start looking and recognizing that this is something that we should you know, support. I think that's one lesson that when you do policy advocacy, obviously there is a lot of presentation of proposals, 
but when they see it on the ground, as they see it also uh, with the experience of Nancy and Kabir, when the government people begin to see it's working, it's actually providing a solution to an age-old problem, so to speak, that they begin to listen. So let's now listen to uh, our friend from ADB. And I think uh, we'd like to begin the discussion with Argo uh, by asking him, based on what you've heard from the panel, uh, how can such practice be taken forward from a multilateral development bank perspective? I mean, how can grassroots movements impact policies? You have to work with national governments. Uh, how do you see what we've heard moving from uh, this uh, experience of influencing governments and then how will that work in terms of impacting policies of a development, uh, a multilateral development bank perspective? Argo? Thank you, Denki, and thanks a lot for having us on the panel. And it was great to hear from colleagues from Kenya, India, Indonesia. Um, I think um, it's, um, I will give an example of how it's happened within ADB in the climate space of ADB. I think working with the grassroots organizations have helped us understand or recognize two things. One is what sort of actions or investments we need to do more and how differently those investments should be approached. And let me give you an example. So we heard from Ibu Roniatun in Indonesia's case, she talked about um, essentially two factors which enabled her uh, to advance the, the resilience um, actions on ground. One was, of course, we heard about the Community Resilience Fund, you know, which enabled them to demonstrate solutions and ultimately get buy-in from local governments. Other side, we also heard about the participating process within government which allowed them to you know, make a space for them to participate and hopefully make a change. So from a, strictly from a bank's perspective, if I try to look at these two enabling factors, one is this community resilience fund and the participatory planning and process, budgeting process, then the question is I need to go back and understand what kind of investments of ADB could potentially support similar solutions. So in the context of Community Resilience Fund, to understand, do we have investments which allows resources to go in the hands of the communities in a more flexible manner, and they can decide how to spend the resources. And Dinky, as you know very well, there are investments like community-driven development processes, which allows you know, investment to go in the hands of the poor and um, communities. Now, so in, traditionally, we do a lot of CDD work, but not maybe in the context of the climate and disaster resilience. So working with the grassroots helps us understand that perhaps we need to do more of such investments so that ultimately the benefits are reaching where it should be. Similarly, in the context of participatory planning and budgeting, I think it also makes us realize that we do a lot of investments with national governments to improve their decentralization processes, which allows for the right kind of space at the local level for local stakeholders to participate. But typically these in in investments, again, don't necessarily look at resilience context, but looking at this solution for Indonesia, I think it's a great um, opportunity for us to see how our investments in decentralization can focus on resilience building and try to create a space, enabling space for the communities to work closely with the local governments and to make their needs um, felt. So for us, I think this um, lessons from grassroots organizations helps us to identify what type of investments can be done, which is in many ways is an opportunity for us. So I think it's an important uh, thing for us to engage in this process and learn from it. 
Secondly, uh, if I go back to the um, context, what Violet was, was saying, and, and congratulations, Violet, for great, great work and getting the policy, um, you know, look at these issues. I think increasingly we realize that issues on land tenure and housing tenure on issues on potentially um, informality, especially in the urban areas, on migration issues, you know, we need to recognize these issues upfront in the climate policy discussion with governments. We cannot say these issues are development concerns only, because I think this blur of development and climate is just, we need to get, get rid of that thing, and start talking about these issues in climate policies, in plans, in legislations, so that ultimately, you know, these underlying drivers of vulnerability are addressed as a part and parcel of climate actions, and this is only how we can lead to real transformation or change on the ground. So just to sum up, for us, this experience of working with grassroots organizations, we see very much as an opportunity to find the right kind of investments which can help our client governments. Thank you. Sorry, didn't get you on mute. Yes, yes sorry. Uh, thank you, Argo. I, but I think a follow-up question to that, which actually also had been asked. So how will it be, be built uh, a partnership with grassroots organization? Uh, will a small grant facility, for example, be a way to go? Or what are the thoughts of ADB now in strengthening partnerships with grassroots organization? Sure, thank you. Maybe I can, um, um, since this is a discussion, maybe I can talk a little bit about how our relationship with Wild Commission has evolved in the last seven or eight years. And in that context, try to explain, answer your question. So we started working with Warwick Commission about, I think, seven years back, where we did start with a small uh, project, uh, one in Indonesia with YEU colleagues and one in Philippines with Dan Pan, her joke yesterday in the other panel. Um, but through that small uh, project, I think that what was innovative was we didn't define what the project should do. We only said that we want a project focusing on resilience building at the local level. It was uh, Dampa and Wai with, with uh, Wai Commission, they defined what the scope of the project could be. And we implemented the project for last, uh, for two years. And the idea was to learn about the solutions, but also about the approaches which grassroots organizations are taking to work closely with local governments to move the agenda forward. And as I said, those approaches are very important because they can inform the way our investments are designed. And you know it very well from your work in government also. So um, this continued, this started our relationship with the Commission. But then even after that particular small project was over, we continued to work with them on this topic and I would say more as a, as a, as a knowledge partner. Uh, I think this is very important because uh, we heard in the opening panel of CBA, Dr. Musa talk about the tacit knowledge which communities have. And I think from our side in the climate space, working with Wairu Commission has helped us um, get access to that tacit knowledge of what's working on the ground, what's not working, and how we can, you know, how we can jointly it, you know, is try to improve the system. So that that knowledge role which Wild Commission, I think, plays needs to be acknowledged and needs to be, I think, um, you know, from our point of view, it's a very important role. And lastly, so this, this relationship has been building. And I think for the last couple of years, we have reached a stage where we are trying to co-create or co-develop a larger program along with other partners like IIAD um, which looks at these issues and community resilience, but not just with the focus of to do more investments, but to do the right kind of investments which can hopefully improve the systems within the government, which is our clients, you know, to do more such actions on ground. So this has been a, a process, an evolving process. But I think over the years, there's a certain amount of trust has been built. I see a lot of questions in the chat box on trust. I think it's, it's also important to understand the trust between 
let's say, social movements like Wario Commission and an MD, a multi development bank like us, and how that can be strengthened. It cannot be strengthened in one single project. It has to be strengthened over years through various types of activities where it's kind of a symbiotic relationship. And I think we are very happy that it has evolved this, this taken this form now, and we look forward to working with them and their constituencies in, in taking the climate action agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you, Argo. I think that's very interesting and very true, as you said. Uh, getting the inputs and getting the voices and getting ideas uh, of solutions coming out of uh, grassroots movements, organizations, community-based organizations, is really the more responsive and effective and efficient use of uh, funds, I think. Uh, having come from government, it was really important, I think, for uh, us, now I'm speaking as someone who used to be with government, uh, when we were designing what would then be a good uh, poverty eradication program in my first stint as uh, the Minister for Social Development in the Philippines, we really looked at the experience on community-driven development because the Philippines, as in most countries in the region, as you know, uh, go, there is quite a rich experience of organizing at the level of the grassroots, done by civil society organizations, done by governments themselves, and that is true for the Philippines. But what we saw was that was important, at least for someone who believed in community-driven uh, development and people's participation, was to convince my colleagues in cabinet that two things that they have not seen or think is possible that people can decide and, and be able to actually craft solutions and hold the money and the money will be spent well. The, fis the fiduciary responsibility was a big debate that I had to go through because uh, for those who may not be familiar in community-driven development, money is actually given to village committees and our friends from Indonesia know this very well because they have expanded this program it was in fact the basis of the village law that is existing today. But it really is about uh, having uh, the trust that the people know best how to do it and you have to provide the capacity to uh, be able to do the reporting, the fiduciary uh, documentation that government audits and bank audits know. I mean, that's the capacity building that we had to do. But the important thing is that to this day, all of uh, what we have supported or invested, as you have said, on uh, community-driven uh, uh, programs, and especially the infrastructure that they built, are all still standing up because it proves that it is the people who have chosen the project that they know will solve their problem. It is important that they know that they will be the ones who will use it so they will not cheat themselves. They will not buy substandard uh, uh, materials. They will make sure that the buildings are all right because it's their children, it's them who's going to use it. So I think uh, the experience is saying that government can be convinced as long as there are allies inside who understand this perspective by the very action that they see on the ground. And that was proven by the experience in Indonesia, the experience, the, all four experiences when they saw that people were benefiting and really supporting it, there were government people who began to see that this is important. So I think at this point, this is important to listen to the voices, get them in, uh, participating and making sure that uh, they are not just consulted uh, and then you go ahead and do what you need to do. I mean, the government and the multilateral institutions. Their input must be part of the plan and the implementation and they should give feedback on how the implementation uh, is being done so that we know accountabilities are clear and in a transparent manner. Now, I think we're really uh, getting uh, a lot of uh, questions so I'd like to move into that right now, so aware of the time and uh, hoping that all questions can be answered. So I'll start with the first question that we've gotten. Uh, it's for Violet. What are you doing as, as you wait for policymaking process for women to be able to lease land for food production 
and without them being thrown out before the end of the lease term end. In other words, what are the measures before it becomes a big, uh, a real policy now? Uh, what, hap what are the measures that you are taking to help them as that process is being done? Violet? Thank you so much, Diggy. Uh, sorry, Please there's another what? related Hello? related to that. Yes, I can hear you, but there's another related question. How are you mm -hmm. handling women's right to own or inherit inherit land in Kenya? Thank okay, you Violet. so much. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, yes. On the first one, I wanted to say that the reason why we were convinced that we can now take these land lease guidelines to become a legal framework is because they were already working. So already the land lease guidelines are on the ground, really working, and our, our, chiefs, our chiefs are using them. The community has accepted them because it was developed by their own community. We are just calling for it to be reorganized as a policy, but so far, the value for uh, land has been calculated. The tool explains how to manage conflicts. It has been endorsed by all stakeholders. We have sensitized and no one is leasing land without using this land lease guideline tool. That's why we said, if we are here already and we are seeing the adoption because we have been checking the adoption we have a strong monitoring team that is checking adoption, checking how conflicts have reduced, checking the number of acreage being uh, pushed to the next taken care of. On the other one, on land inheritance, this is where we began. And you remember in my presentation, I said, as much as it's a very good way, because we want to ensure our constitution talks about the wife being the next of kin of the husband. So she has a right to own land. Even if the marriage separates, they should actually be sharing land. We have been training communities on this because it's already provided in the constitution. We have been holding dialogues with chiefs to show where the gaps are. Hmm. I'm so sorry. It's so okay, sorry. no problem. I'm working from the house and you know, the house has all characters. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, what I want to say is this is where we began. That has been also been addressed. We, we have looked at the traditional information or guidance that gives women right to learn, which all are very good, both the cultural and the law are very good, but they were just not being implemented. So on that one, we are reinforcing an implementation. We are supporting cases of disinheritance to court. Now we are working with African Women Development Fund. They gave us a grant uh, to support our women land link in Africa, which is, and we are advancing the rights of women and land and sure, sharing tools and practice. So that's how we are addressing that. And we are already seeing changes there. Thank you. Thank you, Violet. Uh, the next question I'd like to, uh, has been uh, posed to uh, Ibu Ronyatun and uh, Nia. Uh, what would be your advice to other organized communities seeking to have similar influence? And maybe you can also uh, respond uh, to the question that's presented. What measures do you have in place to have grassroots women to trust you uh, to work with them. What advice can you give on building trust, especially when the initiative is still new and the women have no idea uh, of the good intentions? Uh, Ibu Ronyatun and Nia, please. Langkah-langkah uh, yang saya lakukan untuk memperkuat uh, usulan kami kepada pemerintah, yaitu uh, menunjukkan kegiatan atau uh, kegiatan dan jumlah pemanfaat yang pertama yang kedua adalah mempengaruh berpengaruh pada kehidupan sehari-hari dan untuk bisa menggandeng para uh, perempuan yang ada di pemerintah desa ataupun ibu dari uh, kepala desa dan ibu dukung yang ada di 
cukup pedesaan. So I will translate for Ronia Tun. Uh, so the measures that we take to in order to organize the women groups uh, so that they will be recognized by the government, the local government, and uh, gain support is, for example, one is the women group first must show who they are and what they can do for the community. The activity should be proven that it is benefit not only for the members, but in wider scale to all communities in the village or in the sub-districts. So we must prove that the, the activities is Uh, provide benefit in larger scale than than only in their own member of the group. And the second is the activities that is planned or conducted should be ac uh, accessible and affordable and also eligible. So it close to the needs of the surrounding communities. That uh, therefore the surrounding communities can take part in the activities as well and get benefits from them. And also the third, uh, it is good also to to have networks or to invite the women also that sits at the village government or at the decision-making uh, circle as the members or as the partners so that we can learn from them and understand the process in the decision-making and, and the access how to get involved in the decision-making. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's important to hear Nancy, your experience too, because this question belongs for all. What enables the women to participate in the policy making processes and what were the challenges that you have to face while organizing uh, the women groups? Like how did you get to mobilize them and what were the challenges that you faced in organizing them? Nancy? Uh, is, is Nancy still with us? Yeah, she's there. Um, okay. C can you hear us, Nancy? Okay, as we wait for Nancy to get connected, can I ask Kabir to share the experience too of uh, how did you get, well, not just, I guess, uh, women, but the way speakers to be mobilized and to organize uh, themselves as uh, in terms of building trust with uh, those who initiated uh, the process. I mean, how do you build uh, the connection uh, and, and get organized? Um, I, I think it's important. Uh, the gender component is very essential in the process. Um, the, the role of women in organizing process. If, if one studies the informal workers unions in India, uh, Self-Employed Women's Association was one of the pioneer and probably the first ones. And, and that's where, and they were also the ones who started organizing women waste pickers. And similarly, if you look at the uh, story of Pune, Kagat Kaat Patra Kashtkari Panchayat, which is Pune-based trade union, and if you look at the percentage of number of participants, you will find the percentage of women waste pickers in the trade union will be somewhere around 70 to 80%. So, so the organizing effort was, if you look at waste picking specifically, uh, was led by women. But that is not the reflection of what is going on on the ground. The women are not in majority, um, most majority of women are not, uh, uh, majority of waste pickers are not women. If the percentages are in bigger cities, the majority of waste pickers are men. In the smaller cities, the majority of waste pickers are women. So you have these gender dynamics and gender distribution, but the organizing effort within these two community, within these two genders was led by women. And that sort of built a broader coalition. And waste pickers are at the lowest end of the pyramid. If you look at, again, look at the gender, the upper chains of waste picking are masculine, all men. All the whole of recycling chain is men. So what these women did was organizing themselves and then one using their organized strength as bargaining chip against the masculine power in the upper chain, vis-a-vis -vis, they also used it to build alliances because they, when two men sit together, they probably may not, uh, may not agree on making a trade union, but two women did do that and they have trade unions which are, which are as big as the, the population of many countries in Europe. So, so, so if you look, if you look closely, they then build the, the alliances with the masculine part of the supply chain on their own terms. 
and, and with their collective bargaining skills. And that's very, uh, very essential to, to learn these dynamics uh, of the supply chains within waste picking as well as the other, uh, other sections. So that's important to, to focus on. And that helped us to build alliances. And this was a very theoretical way of explaining it, but this is what happened in the past few years. Thank you, uh, Kabir. I, I really see that it's natural for the alliance building to come from women based on what we've heard so far. Uh, Nancy is back. So Nancy, can you, uh, th there is a question to the panelist, panelists about how you build trust from people who, uh, from women especially, who have not heard about the effort and are just being uh, reached out to and uh, being uh, encouraged to join the action. So as, as the grassroots women's, basically we start small. We start with the little savings groups in the community. So as the Mungano, we started with 10 shillings. So when we, you start small and also put in place the structures, which will make sure that no resources from the communities are lost. So you put in the right, you, cont you have continuous training on leadership training, on savings, on group, everything about the group structures. So when you start small in the, in the settlements, you grow. As you grow, the community will have gained trust in you. And that is what we've been doing as the, the federation. Start with settlement-based savings group start engaging from the settlements as you grow up. So you have one settlement, you network with different settlements. From different settlements, you, you network at a regional level. So after being in a regional level, so you, you network at a county level. So you'll have gained trust from the settlement to the county. Then you go national to, the country, to, to your country. Then you can expand internationally. So you start small and putting the right structures from uh, the little as uh, from the saving group going upwards. So that's what has made the Mungano Federation gain trust from the community. So even when we start doing projects, we still do the same. Start from the settlement level, going, growing bigger. So I, I, I think it's important, uh, thank you, Nancy. We, we can see uh, three things seems to be the common uh, uh, theme that women tend to be more able to build alliances. Uh, it comes more naturally. Second, uh, it is important to acknowledge that because they experience the problems or issues more intensely in most patriarchal societies that we all have, they end up with having to find the solution. And uh, I think this is the reason why they are able to immediately step up and take the lead. Because when they take the lead, they're able to make sure that the benefits go to a larger population. But it is really more along the common good frame that uh, they operate from. And, and we find that uh, very interestingly enough in our own experience, uh, when, uh, money comes into uh, the project, more often than not, they want to give it to women as people who will manage the finances because the chances of it being misused is a lot smaller, if not at all, because they can manage the money uh, very well. And uh, the usual um, fear that if it is given to men, that it will be used for uh, other purposes other than for the project. Now, I think we can take in uh, two more questions uh, or, uh, yeah, one or two more questions. I think there's a lot of questions that's being asked uh, to Argo in ADB. Uh, would ADB in, be interested in supporting this type of grassroots initiatives through grant facilities? Uh, it's really exciting to hear how seriously ADB climate team are engaging with these issues. Do you think you are getting traction on these ideas with all parts of ADB and other multilaterals. Over to you, Argo. Yeah, th thank, thank you, Dinky. Um, I, I think as my um, other panelists said, um, it's a process for everybody. 
And I wouldn't try to oversell, even within ADB, it's a process. And what has happened is maybe because of this close partnership with grassroots organizations, and in the climate space, we have started interacting with more colleagues who work on social development, on gender, on governance, on uh, rural development, um, and try to see how their investments, their processes can look at these issues. So this has um, helped us move beyond looking at infrastructure in the climate context, but give equal importance to social and institutional aspect, which are critical for building resilience. So I think this is a great move. Again, it's a slow process, but I think we see that happening more in the banks, which is a us. And in that context, um, you know, we have been, uh, as I mentioned briefly, developing this program on community resilience. And um, I don't believe that all solution is about giving money. That's not the only solution. I think we heard uh, from Sheila in the opening panel where she talked about, typically MDBs talk about very big picture and actions happening on the ground level, but how do we make that meet together? So for us, I think it's important to realize that even if it's not, even, even as an institution, if we cannot give direct, direct money to the poor and other communities, can we help improve the system, the channel in which resources um, can flow? When I say resources, I don't mean only financial resources, but also knowledge around learning. Such resources can flow. And this is the focus of the, the new program which we are developing is how can we help our client governments improve their system, their capacity, so that the right kind of targeting happens, the right kind of partnership happens at the ground level, the right kind of money flows to the local level also. So I think it's, it's much more complicated than just addressing through financial resources. And it requires very much a very, uh, a kind of a whole of, uh, you know, whole of um, government, whole of community approach uh, to a whole of society approach to, towards it. And I think it's a slow step, it will take time, but we are learning from the process and hopefully we'll get somewhere together. I also want to highlight one thing over here, Dinky, at least from our experience, even financial institutions, funding partners, bilateral donors, philanthropists, people are comfortable when they see like-minded institutions working together and co-creating programs. I don't know if they're very used to seeing different types of institutions with a common objective coming together to co-create and co-develop programs. And I think that needs to happen more because if you don't get different types of institutions together, you will not be able to address all kinds of solutions which is very much required from a climate action point of view. So I think it's very much needed that everybody starts um, you know, working across the board and with different kinds of partners to push this agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Argo. And just building on that, I, I think uh, getting institutions to work together, again, in, in the recent experience I had with government, the Asia Development Bank and World Bank work together with our government then, with us, uh, in developing and improving community-driven development and conditional cash transfer. And it was not just the fund investment that was very important, as you pointed out. It was also developing a targeting system that really reached the, the marginalized and the vulnerable, uh, trying to minimize, if not eliminate, elite capture and uh, making sure that we're able to really reach those who need it most. And th that was a very important process. And in that process, we were involving the communities that were being asked to give their information and data uh, by way of a community assembly that validates the data on uh, the targeting measure. So I, I think that's very important, but that was, I, I will tell you uh, as the minister then, it was not that easy to get the two banks to work together and have a common frame. I mean, you would think that that would be easy, but as you said, it's really a slow process. I think for a last question, uh, many people are, are continue to ask, so how do you measure this? Because to be able to uh, convince 
uh, those who hold the resources that this is well uh, uh, monitored and it, there is a lot of measurements and indicators that we use to make sure that the advocacy does impact positively to communities. I think the monitoring and evaluation and learning is always a question that many of the funding agencies ask. I mean, you know, uh, that's very nice you're doing this thing, uh, but how does it really impact? How do you know that there is an impact? So maybe can I ask Violet to uh, explain how you measure uh, this, uh, your success or your progress in the work that you're doing in terms of the advocacy to impact national policies? Violet? Uh, did she drop out? No, she's still there. No, sorry, mute. Yes. I'm there. Yes, I'm so sorry. No problem. Go ahead, Violet. Yeah. So I had talked about how. Thank you. I had talked about how we monitor progress. First of all, we have developed a tool with TMG German uh, that it works from Berlin. And this tool that we have developed is a tool that we use to measure uptake on how many people are leasing land because we have an application form that the parties that are leasing land fill using the guidelines that we have developed. So we use these forms that remain in the office of the assistant chief to measure uptake. We also follow further to listen to the changing trend, like how many girls and uh, youth generally are now participating in agricultural activities because as they lease land, we also take names and age, we take age and gender of the people that are leasing land. And then we also measure the number of assistant chiefs because when it began, it was a volunteer. So it was like, you are not forced to adopt it in your sub location. But here we have a solution. But now every assistant chief comes asking, come and sensitize my community and the elders in, in my village so that we can start using the land list. So we also measure the number of assistant chief, village elders that are supporting the process. And we measure how the changes in, um, things like production, productivity. Right now we have a GPS system that we are using to track the amount of land that has leased and the amount of land that is being rehabilitated. Because you actually need to show people how this is translating to soil rehabilitation and management, which is a negative implication of climate change, how this is really addressing the issue. So now we are putting in acreage and at the end of every year, we are able to say this is the amount of land that grassroots women and youth were able to rehabilitate because of land leasing process. So that's how we measure the uptake. Thank you, Violet. So as, as we can see, there are very clear indicators and there are systems that are put in place by the grassroots women organizations, by the way speakers. I mean, they, in other words, the community-based organizations and the alliances that they uh, uh, organize do measure their work because in the end, it means solutions at the very ground level. It's not uh, monitoring and evaluation and learning for the funders or for uh, other institutions supporting them. They're doing that because it's important for them to know if they're nearing the solution or not, because the solution that they're working on is a life and death issue for them. So it is important for them to monitor if they're doing progress or not. If, if uh, putting in all that effort, taking risks uh, for some of them in other geographies where these kinds of work are not readily accepted, it is important for them if it is if they are progressing. So I think uh, when people are asking. Do you, do you know if there is progress? Do you know, uh, how do you monitor? How do you do such a fluffy advocacy role as some uh, people would think? There are measurements being done and very concrete indicators of whether the organization, the community-based uh, efforts 
are moving forward. So we would like Maybe. to thank, you know, it, yes, Maybe. any addition? Yes. Yes, I, I, I'm just remembering something because in the land lease guideline that we want to make a framework, one of the biggest issues that came was that men would lease land in a male-headed household, the entire land, and not leave even a small portion for the family to grow food. And this was really affecting women because women want land for food, men want land for cash crop. So they lease land, they plant sugarcane, especially sugarcane, a lot here. So the family does not have land. So right now, even if these men use the land lease guideline, we still have to go back in our measuring to know, are they following the guideline to the latter to ensure that, okay, they are using the application form, but if they are leasing for cash crop, we follow to ensure they have left land as we have agreed, at least a third of the land is left to the family uh, food. We have to confirm that. So those are some of the things we are measuring because you may just measure the uptake, uptake and be happy, but in reality, the change that you wanted to see, women and youth accessing land for agricultural business and household improvement is not happening. So we really care about these things. Yes, thank you. I know that I said that would be the last question, but I just saw a last question here, which I think is important to uh, get the view of Argo. How can we expect ADB to play a role in systems change agenda towards building community resilience? What role can we expect ADB to play? Uh, very quickly, sorry, Argo, but I think it's an important question to ask a multilateral institution in this kind of forum. No, th thanks, Dinky, and thanks for the question, uh, Monisha. Uh, I mean, uh, we have to recognize ADB is only one small organization, right? But I think uh, what, is, what is important is that um, how in our day-to-day -day interaction with client governments, and this is interaction beyond specific investments, we try to recognize these issues and where necessary, you know, dialogue with the government to give them the evidence that things at the ground level are working. As I said, it's, um, I mean, system change is a very big issue as, as the question itself says. But, so there's no um, single solution for it. It differs from country to country, different countries, governments, governance, country decentralization processes where there are currently political setup. So I think we have to be cognizant of these factors, but it's more important to recognize that with no single program, no big single investment, we will achieve all this. And it's a long process where from our side, we need to continue working with the client governments and help them in improve the systems and capacity with the, with the intention that ultimately those systems will benefit the ones who need the most. So I see that that's the only way to go uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Argo. I think we've had a very rich exchange uh, and a very, of course, interesting and very uh, thought-provoking uh, discussion on uh, how we move forward on making sure that the initiatives on the ground uh, done by grassroots organizations, we've seen how they have been able to impact policy while it is still a continuing struggle while it is still uh, a lot of negotiations and a lot of movement and mobilization, there are already victories in place. And uh, I think uh, the experience that has been shown by uh, Violet, by Nancy, Iburoniato, and Mia, and Kabir uh, is a testimony to that. Uh, at this point, what I'd like to uh, invite everyone, uh, thank you for all of the rich uh, information. This is again going to be uh, put together by SDI and the Huayro Commission uh, for all of us to reflect upon after this conference. But at this time, there's a Mentimeter that will come out uh, and the Mentimeter will ask us, what are your takeaways from this session? What did you learn from this session? So can we have that Mentimeter there? It's again in the chat box. So just write uh, key takeaways from the session. Uh, you can have about 250 characters. Uh, and I think it would be good if you could tell us what really struck you. And uh, we will be trying to put together uh, these answers. And uh, 
we will be looking at uh, give it a minute or two. So land rights are crucial to resilience building of the poor. Rich experience from the ground, voices from the grassroots. Start small and out in place structures to build influence. Women-led organizations can, le can lead the changes needed towards more resilience. Grassroots women are drivers of change at the community level. Uh, these are some of the uh, responses that uh, have come out. Voices from the ground is vital. Uh, start small and improve structures. The whole process of mobilization community and monitoring tools was something that was, is a takeaway from here. Land rights play an important role and is often overlooked in intervention. Okay, that's very important, I think. And how that really is actually from the, uh, the stories that we've heard, that really uh, is a big issue if we really want to talk about adaptation and resilience. So these are some of the uh, responses that we've had. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot more and that would be part of uh, the documentation that we will be uh, getting uh, from uh, our uh, documenters of this effort. At this time, I would like to invite uh, uh, your final comments. Uh, I'd like to invite Argo first to give your final comments. Thank you, Dinky. I think that was a great um, session, a lot of learning for, for me itself, hearing the four great cases. I think what really struck me is, you know, we talk a lot about um, scale and resilience, and this is important, scale is important, but I think we often talk think about scale in, in a geographical context of scaling out. While that is important, I think the scaling up, what we call political scaling up, where you look at a small solution, making a small difference in an area, it's also a very important part of scaling up. And I think that needs to be recognized and not just the geographical scaling up because these small um, political scaling up ex examples or evidences do have a great, um, they're grounded and they do make a difference in somebody's life. So I think we can't ignore that. We need to talk more about it so that more um, support is, is available to help such scaling up happen on the ground. This is what I uh, actually take away from all the four key presentations today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Argo. I'd like to invite Violet now as the chair of uh, the Huayro Commission to also give her uh, comments. Violet. Thank you so much, Dige. Uh, Wairu Commission believes in uh, the contribution of grassroots women and grassroots women as solution providers in many struggles that uh, the communities are facing in development. And uh, when I listen to all these stories, including what I was sharing, is that our struggles is what we learn from, and out of these struggles, we are able to develop solutions based on the things that we are going through in our community. These solutions, and I'm happy of the last speaker, may look small, but actually how they are able to be advanced, the number of people that are getting involved in that very community, and the solutions uh, that they are addressing is actually a magnitude. And uh, uh, even the partnerships that you are seeing evolve from this. And uh, what these um, solutions are also demonstrating is that as grassroots women, we don't just, um, it is different when we invite governments to meetings to bring solutions. And it's also, uh, it, it is also unique when we start by mapping our own problems, doing community consultations. So the force when we are inviting government is different and the power shift is actually can be seen at that level, which positions us as grassroots women differently. It is not easy to invite the minister uh, of even a county to turn up for a meeting uh, for the grassroots. They usually just come to say, I'm coming to open, and then they go. But when we shifted this to start providing solution, because they also have a mandate to deliver in agricultural productivity, to deliver on economic well-being of the society. So when we provide these solutions and we are working in a collective, 
whenever we invite them, they are not coming to open a meeting and uh, go and just provide a blueprint report to say the government will work on ABC, but they are listening from the people with solution. That makes them sit in the meeting. And even in our Zoom meetings that we were doing throughout this time of COVID, because we used COVID to show how food security is important at that time and how these policies should actually be accelerated and be implemented quicker than before because of the current pandemic that we are in where people need food. So we would find already the minister has logged on in the Zoom call and is waiting for us to log in to start the discussion. And we started the discussion in a friendly way, partnership, equality, no one is more powerful than the other. We are calling each other and listening to each other. And this is actually the kind of partnership that we are talking about. This is the partnership that the grassroots women are calling about, partnership that is meaningful, that reorganizes us as equal. We people are talking about resources and I'm happy that resource is not number one, but equally these processes need to be supported. And we know in the thinning world, the first people to leave the drawing board when we submit our applications are the grassroots women. So we really need to look at these alliances, the coalitions the grassroots women are building to be able to strengthen them and calculate how much money could actually go to support these kind of initiatives that are working for the people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Violet. The power of organization, the power of negotiation, the power of alliance building and the power of partnership. So Ranjana, can I uh, invite you now to do the closing remarks? Thank you, Dinky. Wow, that was really something, a lot of food for thought from grassroots movements as well as policy makers. I'm just going to reiterate a couple of things that have stayed with me and I think I'll be mulling over many of the comments when I listen to the recording again. But uh, I think that what we heard is essentially that grassroots driven solutions which are coupled with the leadership in the constituencies of the grassroots actually are making policy makers sit up and listen. And when, when they come with solutions to offer, then that shifts the dynamic between the grassroots and the government. And terrific point there from Orgo about the scale, uh, that vertical scaling up and connecting and making these changes uh, from, from the ground is as important as scaling out. Um, I also liked the fact that um, he talked about the idea that we should keep, uh, we shouldn't separate, keep separating climate and disaster resilience from development. We know at the grassroots level that they're, they're completely linked and they're interlinked and entangled, but it's good to hear someone from a multilateral bank say that we shouldn't separate these and work in silos. And um, we also heard the, the very important point about underlying risk drivers. How often do you go to a climate or disaster meeting and hear people talking about land rights? But it is in fact such an important factor uh, the ability to claim and gain and maintain and hold on to your assets in the face of adversity is such an important factor in building resilience and, and therefore property rights become such an important issue. But it's such a contentious, politically contentious issue that people really want to come close to it. So I, I, with that, I want to thank our terrific panelists. Big thanks to Violet, Nancy, Ronia Thun, Mia, Kabir, and Orgho for their remarks. It's been super hearing from you. And also a very special thanks to Dinky for her fabulous facilitation. But also I enjoyed hearing how the pioneering work that she did with government in, uh, in the Philippines and bringing together the multilateral banks to work on community-driven development have really created such a legacy. It went forward to become the village law in Indonesia and is now being discussed as one of the major mechanisms that the multilateral banks can use to actually promote uh, community engagement and put money in the hands of communities to decide on what kinds of solutions they need locally. 
So with that, I also want to give big thanks to our volunteers for managing us and handling all the technical things that we have no idea how to manage. And big thanks to the audience, for especially those of you who woke up early in Europe. And I hope that this was something that was really worth your time. I thought it was. So thank you so much to all of you. Um, and enjoy the rest of your time at CBA. So bye-bye. Thank you very much. We say now goodbye to everyone. People can sleep. People can go on with their day. And thank you. We'll see you again in the other parts of the CBA. Thank you very much. <laughs>